Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, this is obviously very uh, a special privilege, not just for you, but also for me, because I, you know, sometimes we don't have conversations, even though we see our parents every day, we don't always have these kinds of conversations with them. So sometimes we need opportunities like this uh, to have conversations that we should always be having with our parents anyway. So it's really uh, an honor for me to have both, both my father and my mother here. You know, it's interesting, we had a comment. I asked my father last year, I said, do you consider yourself a survivor? So why do I ask that question? Because I guess I grew up not really looking uh, at my parents as survivors, because they had always talked about, they, they were both born in Europe, and you'll hear about it, but they had always talked about being lucky, which, which they certainly were. Uh, they didn't go through many of the horrible, horrible experiences that so many survivors and more, as you just heard now. We just read names that, that go on forever, right? And we just got up to the, to the letter B. That's they are families, right? So just imagine, right? How many people didn't come out of Europe in 1945? So I grew up knowing that my parents were from Europe, but knowing that their stories were a little bit different and they always, their perspective always was that it was pretty lucky. But at the same time, thinking about Yom HaShoah with the years going on, thinking about how so many different stories there are out there of people who did survive Europe during the war, who have incredible stories and amazing and important stories for me to know, my children to know, and for them to be able to tell their children and for you to be able to, to hear those stories. That's what we're here to do today. I'm going to try to ask my father a couple of questions. Um, and through that to learn his story, and then also to open the floor to you to be able to ask any follow-up questions that you want um, so that we can have a meaningful conversation. So Abba, um, why don't you tell us about where you were born, where you're from. We have a map up over there if it's helpful. Um, okay. And about life, you were born in 1937, if I'm allowed to reveal You're allowed to say that. It's not born a military in 1937. Uh, and tell us about the life that you grew up with before uh, things got uh, really bad. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for uh, Mrs. Richter for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to speak to, to this uh, wonderful, wonderful group of young people. And uh, I have a granddaughter in this class. I don't see her, but okay, here she is. Okay, so it's a double, it's a double honor to speak to her. And uh, again, I'll, I'll tell you a few things uh, as an introduction, and then feel free to ask or interrupt me if I if I'm not clear, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But since uh, uh, my son revealed the the uh, the great military secret that I was born in 1937, I'd like to tell you that it's too bad that I can't really show the map, but if you see the circle in the map, that's uh, Romania, much of it. Okay, uh, and I'll tell you how we were survivors, but first one more introduction. Uh, my son asked whether we were survivors or not in terms of the questions. I really think, you know, you, you said it all, a particular statement that they say there, that I think that every Jew, whether even if he lived in America, is a survivor. Because what Hitler wanted wasn't just the destruction of the Jews in Europa. In fact, it's called by some other people, Khurban, the Shoah is called Khurban Europa. What does a Khurban Europa mean? Khurban. What is Khurban? Khurban. Oh, Khurban. Okay, sacrifices. Khurban. 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 Destruction or burning? The destruction of, of uh, so somebody calls it the destruction of European Jewry. It's correct, but it's all, what Hitler wanted was the destruction of all of Jewry. So Jews in America are also in a manner of speaking survivors. But of course, you were not in the camps. And luckily, our family was not in the camps either. We lived in Romania, and Romania was divided. Again, if the, the southern part of Romania and Transylvania remained what I call independent Romania. It was an independent country called Romania with the, with the king and the prime minister. And something strange happened in that independent Romania when the Shoah came in 1940. You know that uh, countries have elections. So in 1940, there was a big election for the, who should be the prime minister of Romania. And the person who ran on an anti-Semitic platform, his name was 
Antonescu, Marshal Antonescu, who ran on the platform that if I get Jews will uh, not have the right to go to university, Jews will not have the right to go to their own schools, Jews will not be able to be more than 5% in medical school, etc., etc. They called it the numer numerous clauses. What do they call that here? A quota. Quota, correct. Uh, this person who won that election, and he won that election, when Hitler wanted to come to Romania with his uh, plan to put the Jews in ghettos and transport them to, to concentration camp, so Antonescu told them, I hate the Jews as much as you do, but I want you to know I want to handle our, my Jews my way. And that was our luck. So there were some difficult times there. There were very difficult times in Romania. I'll give you a few small examples. Some of them will seem very funny to you. Some of them will be tragic. But whatever it happened, we did not go together. What happened was that in southern Transylvania, southern Romania, there were 200,000 Jews in the midst of all hell around them. I'll soon tell you about that hell also. But nevertheless, we were saved. You know, when I think of it, and I, I read the history of the Shoah a lot, I think about, you know, I took bicycle lessons. My, my parents took me to eat ice cream in an ice cream store. I took bicycle lessons, I took violin lessons, did all these extracurricular activities. You have it sports, Romania wasn't so big on sports, it was big on other things. But nevertheless, I lived a rel I took, you know, I, I, I played with kids in the street and so on and so forth. And all that from 1940 to 1945, that's what happened to us. So, on the other hand, for example, if my mother would send me shopping to a store to get something from the grocery store, so if I came before 11 o'clock, they said, you Jewish, we can't sell you anything. We can only sell after 11 o'clock. But after 11 o'clock, nothing was left in the store. So there were this kind of discriminations against Jews, but there wasn't this, uh, this, this, this devilish thing of destroying the Jews, certainly not putting them in ghettos. And that was our luck. So we lived a relatively normal life. So I want to tell you something that's relevant to you. My father was a rabbi of a city, a relatively big city in Romania. He was the chief rabbi and therefore the educational system, you know, to, to public school was difficult for us to go. So the Jewish community had its own, had its own school. So my father's community, my father's chief rabbi, he was in charge of, of the school that teaches Jewish secular stuff. So from eight to one we went to the Jewish school. And we studied math and science and geography and whatever you study in first, from first to, to sixth grade. That was the elementary school there. And in the afternoon, from two to six or from three to seven, we went to something that's called a cheder. And in the cheder, we studied Jewish stuff. We studied Chumash and Gemara and so on and so forth and so forth. So let me tell you why I consider you lucky. I mean, you know the first day what we learned in school? What was the first lesson we had in school? If you went to an... What's the guess? <laughs> yes? Guess? What do you want? What do you think? In the school, in the secular school. We came in 8 o'clock. What was the first thing the principal came in to tell us? Specifically the boys. To wear seat, seat. Okay. To wear keeper. Oh, wait. Geography. Geography, okay. What? Be careful. Be careful, yeah, Maybe in what like way being careful, correct? One more guess? ABCs? ABCs. <laughs> okay, okay, ABCs also. The first thing he taught us, you see, since it was a school that taught secular subjects, and since the Romanian authorities wanted to make it difficult, so even it was under our we were not allowed to sit in the kippah in school. You had to sit without the kippah. And there were inspectors coming in. So the first thing that the principal taught us every year as we came to the class, the first day of school was how to take off the kippah fast. That was the thing that we learned. Because chas if he will, the, the, the inspector will catch the boys with the kippah, the school will get a fine. And it was easy to give fines to Jewish schools. You know, that, that's anti-Semitism. Again, it wasn't, it wasn't Hitler, it wasn't ghetto, it wasn't concentration camp, but it was anti-Semitism, very good anti-Semitism, because why did, it care, why did they care if in a, in a school the boys were to keep up? But that's what they had to learn. And the principal came and told us a million times, make sure about that. You know, the other, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Continue. Uh, I, I know that I grew up, um, and it's a little bit funny because we 
kind of broke that rule in our house now, but I grew up knowing that you were very afraid of dogs. Okay, um, I was going to tell you the next story. Yeah. I was my very afraid, was afraid of, of dogs. My father, well, he's kind I'll of afraid of dogs too, but he still comes to my house even though we have one. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing when he said be careful was as follows. That, wasn't, that was when we went home both from school and from Cheder. Uh, we went home from school, you know, we lived in homes, various homes, and I can't tell you it was an everyday occurrence, but uh, three times a week it was an occurrence. Sometimes very mild and sometimes very rough, and the one had an effect on me. Generally, kids came out from school, from their other schools, their public schools, and they saw a kid, a Jewish kid walking on the block, etc. The first thing is they attacked him, sometimes verbally. Why did you kill our God? Or if they were worse, they said, you Jew, God killer, go somewhere. Which is a word I will not repeat in SAR, and so on and so forth. That was an almost daily occurrence. Sometimes it was even worse. Sometimes, once I remember, I can't forget that, I came home from school, it was a winter day, and it wasn't one or two boys, it was a gang of six or seven with a dog. And they took me up to the second floor, and with the dogs, they rolled me down on the, on the ladder, on the, onto the snow and the ice, and I have a feeling that if my father wouldn't have had just passed at that time, uh, I don't know if I would have been here. I certainly would have uh, been, been injured, uh, much worse than I was. And ever since, and ever since, when I see a dog on one side of the street, I always went on the other side of the street. And when I see a group of, uh, of non-Jewish boys on one side of the street, I went on the other side of the street. When I came to America and I grew up, okay, thank you. When I came to America and I grew up, I really tried to fight myself and correct that. But I, you will not remember, there was a time, the, your teachers will, there was a time a few years ago, about 30 years ago in New York, there was a big crime wave. And it came back to me again. But I tried to fight it. But nevertheless, if I see a dog, I, I, I'm worried. I, when I, when I, I come to Binny's home and uh, initially, and the dog was there, I, they knew what they had to do with the dog when I came in. So it was that, that kind of life. Uh, learning how to get with the kippah and how learning how to go home and be safe and so on. Um, you've told us this is a story that I, you know, you've told us in the family a lot about your, about your parents and specifically about your your mother's connection to things that were happening in the Shoah. And like you said, not you know maybe 50 miles away from your house, the Jews were actually being deported to concentration okay. camps. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what happened, and that's why in the series that you have in SAR. When many years ago, when Bini was in sixth grade, I was invited by Rabbi Fould to give one of the first interviews. He was the principal about my heroes, and I said, "Then that's what you're referring to. Why my mother is my hero?" So I'll tell you the story. Okay, Romania was. Oh, you don't. Know, doesn't matter. Uh, we lived in what's called Transylvania and Southern Romania. It doesn't matter. As I told you, my father was the chief rabbi of town. <coughs> and therefore, because he was involved in many things, remember in Romania, uh, without anti-Semitism, a rabbi was also the representative of the Jewish community, sometimes in parliament, sometimes in the local parliament, sometimes in the national parliament. So whatever it is, my father knew what was going on, not only in Romania, but also in Poland and so on and so forth. As I told you, Romania was divided, and I told you one part of the division of Romania where we lived. But Romania was also what's called Eastern Romania, which is neighboring Russia now, which now is toying around with independence, if you heard Moldova and so on. My mother's brother, I come from a rabbinic family, my, brother, my mother's brother was also a rabbi. And he lived in a very, to us, it was a big city called Baku. It was on the eastern part of Romania. It was still part of integral Romania, so there was no problem of deportation. But that area was always involved in the politics between not only Germany, but Russia and Romania. And there was a rumor that that part of Romania, with the city of Baku, those of you just to, to, who speak in your geography, maybe it will help you place this. There was a principal in Yeshiva University High School called Rabbi Safran. 
His grandfather was a very famous rabbi. He was the rabbi in Baku. And my uncle was his successor. To make a long story short, my father heard that that part of Romania is going to be ceded to Russia. In, and if, if it ceded to Russia, it meant one thing. Certainly, there may be deportation, even though it's not necessary. And not only there may be deportation, uh, deportation, but there may be deportation to a place you should know. It's called Transnistria. Transnistria, if you follow a little geography, is of the northeast of Romania. It's now a little bit independent. You know, there's a big fight there, what's going on. But in Transnistria, a thousand Jews from Romania were deported there. In Transnistria, there were no gas chambers. There were not even shooting squads, but a hundred thousand Jews of Transnistria died from hunger, from thirst, from sickness. They were simply in the open fields, in the cold and the heat and the rain, etc., etc. And one of those families was my mother's family. My grandfather was also a rabbi. He was a rabbi of Storozhinets. You didn't hear of Storozhinets, but you must have heard of Chernovitz and around that place. And they were transported there. And there's an, in the Romanian equivalent of the New York Times, there's an article that was sent to me by somebody who knew me called The Minion of the Dead, which said, had the detailed story of how my, fam my, my grandparents, my grandfather, my grandmother, my uncles, etc., in that family died. So Transnistria was a horrific place, and my father knew about it before it was public. To make a long story short, there was a rumor that my uncle's city, Bacau, the Jews from that city, will be taken to Transnistria. And, okay, so how do you save them? How do you save them? Remember, we're in Romania. And I told you about anti-Semitism. So I told you things that to you seem funny, the Yarmouk, etc. I want to tell you something more important. If they, uh, when you, uh, somebody took a train on Romania uh, and they found out, the, the uh, inspector of the ticket found out that you're Jewish, so if they were kind to you, they put you down in the middle of nowhere by slowing the train. And if they were not kind to you, they just threw you off in the middle of nowhere. And you have to go with the train to, from Sibiu, where we were in relative safely, to Bacau. It's a 12-hour trip with a stop in Bucharest. So how do you do that? How do you inform my uncle that you'll do it? There was no email. There was no fax. Even if there was a telephone, the, Nazis, uh, the, the fascist government took away our telephone. To go, you know how in olden times they made phone calls? I know that we, in the age of cell phones we don't know. But, but if you didn't have a cell phone, you went to the post office. From Israel, you still may remember, those who are old enough, not you. <laughs> you went to the post office and there was a phone and you paid a certain amount and you shouted into something and everybody heard the conversation. So, so imagine, how does one go for, uh, from, how does it inform my uncle that they may be deported? Okay, how does she tell her brother? How, do, how does my danger? mother tell her brother that, 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 that he's in danger? Yeah, yes. yes. Secret code, okay. Secret code. You are right. What? The letters were secret a little bit, but, but till a letter comes, yes? Hebrew. Hebrew, well, okay. They wrote Yiddish. But, but till a letter comes in wartime in Romania, it wasn't one day, it could have been 15 days, and the, 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 the event could have happened. What else? Uh, so she could have taken the train there. Okay, she could have taken the train. Very good. She remember, it's dangerous to take the Remember, it's dangerous, but it's dangerous to take the train. So I'll tell you what my mother did. In Romania, it was very uh, farmers were sight because they came in. So my mother practiced for about a day or a day and a half, not long. She first of all took robes, clothes of a farm woman. And in Romania, farm women, tra farm people traveled as fowls. A few radishes, a chicken, a few eggs, and something was the Romanian staple called mamaliga, that was the poor person's bread. And that you and and you had that and you had that cover. So my mother practiced a little bit how you carry these things, eggs and the chicken and mamaliga and maybe perhaps something else. And uh, she practiced it, and she decided to take the train, which is a 12-hour trip with a stop in Bucharest.
and she went that way and of course she came to my uncle and they took they couldn't take a taxi because in, in Bacau there weren't taxis that were available. They took, you know what, they took a horse and buggy with the family with very few uh, provisions and they went 60 kilometers south, which was safe. And, she, and that's where my uncle lived till about a year, till they found out that it's safe, etc., etc. If And she came back. If they would have stopped, somebody would have stopped her because they always, the, the inspector for the ticket also asked for an ID card. And the ID card of every Jew at that time had a big stamp. J, what does that stand for? Jew. The, the train, she could have been in the middle of nowhere and uh, who knows what. But they don't that? always, they didn't always know, you know, you go on the bus, sometimes somebody can come and check, do you have a ticket? But they don't always do that, and so she was lucky. For the idea because she was dressed up, so she looked and like a farmer, so she played the She looked like, like a farm woman, like a peasant woman, etc., etc., and she was anyway in third class, so Jews didn't travel in third class those days, so there was a relatively, but that was the chance she took. Um, and the whole family was saved, and uh, the grandchildren of that uncle are now in Los Angeles and in Israel. And uh, hold on one second. How did you end up in America? How we ended up in America is as follows. Uh, actually, we were supposed to go to Israel. To, at that time, it was in Israel in 1947. It was in. Uh, it was called pa Mandatory Palestine. But, you know, it wasn't so easy to go to Palestine at that time. You needed something. You needed what we call a visa, but we called it a certificate. It was called, you couldn't, end, under whose rulership was is Palestine at that time before, before, who knows? Yeah, the British. The British, okay. And you needed a British certificate, and it wasn't so easy to get a certificate. And... Therefore, in Romania, all of a sudden something changed. It wasn't the fascists who were in rule, who won the elections in 1945-46 were the communists. And the communists, we ran away, paradoxically, we ran away from the communists, who liberated us. But, and we couldn't make it to Palestine, so we went to America. And where'd you come? We came in 1948. We came in 1948, and... Uh, for a year, you, you couldn't come to America so easily from Romania either, but they had such what's called an affidavit. An affidavit means that a particular group for a business or a synagogue, in the case of my father, requested the government to please allow Rabbi Kraus to come because we need a rabbi and uh, my father spoke English, etc., etc. So we got it, so we lived in Minneapolis for a year. We had family there, they, that's how they arranged it, but that's how it happened. So we came in 1948, just after the Medina was formed, and, uh, and we lived in America for a year, and then we came to New York. Shall you have a question? Where did Jews travel on trains? What class? Where did How did Jews usually travel on trains? Like you said that she traveled third class and Jews didn't travel third class. No, Jews generally were of a higher class, so they traveled on second, second class or but first there class. There was a lot of travel on that and, time. And, and not on that time. At that time, it was difficult. Jews, At that right. time, Jews couldn't travel on... No, they couldn't. It, it was dangerous. Do you have a question? I don't know. Oh. What's the question? Oh. What was the question? Okay, so the gas the gas chambers, which is a very obviously a terribly sad part of this whole story, was those were in certain concentration camps. Okay, Auschwitz is the famous one, right? Um, and people that ended up there, most people uh, didn't come out. And most, in many situations. The Jews didn't know they were going there. They didn't, they didn't, right? You didn't have, like you heard, you didn't have internet, you didn't have such great information. The Jews of Hungary, especially a lot of, they didn't know exactly where they were, where they were going. And unfortunately, that's what, you know, that's what happened to a lot, a lot of people, right? Any other comments or questions? Uh, yeah. Which city did you go to when? Oh, when you came to America? I went to Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
Anybody from Minneapolis? Anybody have relatives in Minneapolis? Okay. You do? Really? Oh, yes. Okay. 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 What's your name? What's your last name? What's your name? I Daniel don't know. Landman. Okay. Um, I would ask one last question before we go. What do you think, right? We talked about this being such an important day. What do you think is the most important message that fifth graders in SIR uh, should take away from a day like Yom HaShoah? Well, I think that uh, in certain ways it's an easy answer and then it's the most difficult answer. But the last thing that you did in Yom HaShoah was Anim Amin Bemunash Leimah Baviyat HaMashiach. You believe in the coming of Mashiach, which means, of course, Jews believe in the coming of Mashiach, but the message of Mashiach is that whatever evil there is today, there can be and will be a better tomorrow. But that's not just something that will be thrown on you. When people like you, young people like you, internalize this message that you don't make peace with the evil and then you become better to yourself and to your others and, and you have faith in the tomorrow, then you can transform that tomorrow and you can transform it into a day in which the Shoah will only be a memory. Chas v'shalem will not become a reality again. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Abba, for speaking. And we really appreciate it. I said many things I didn't want to say, but I didn't.